Restaurant Unstoppable, episode 631 with Chef Julian Medina. And with excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, Chef Julian Medina. Chef, are you feeling unstoppable today? <laughs> Sometimes I feel. Tomorrow, t- uh, this morning I do. <laughs> nice. I have a nice coffee, so yes. Beautiful. Today I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right, let's rock and roll. So raised in Mexico City, Julian Medina's inspiration was his father and grandfather's authentic home cooking. Training professionally in Mexico City, Julian was brought to New York City to be Chef de Cuisine at Maya, which earned two stars from the New York Times under Julian's leadership. Maintaining his position at Maya, Julian enrolled in the French Culinary Institute, graduating with recognition ever since he's been opening restaurants in partnerships until 2017 when he opened La Chula, his first solo restaurant today. Chef Medina is the chef owner of, and you're going to have to help me out here. Just list them because <laughs> I am going to destroy these names trying to say them. Go ahead. Um, Toloache, uh, Tacuba, Copelia. Um, which one I'm missing? La so Chula, <laughs> uh, Latineria. So you yeah. got a lot going on. In La you. Chula times three, right? In TKS? Yes. Is the other one. So, man, you're busy. Uh, I cannot wait to dive into your story to find out how you got to where you are today. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a success quote or mantra. What do you got for us? Oh, man. Um, it's a hard one. But um, what I think and I always tell people is just to stay humble, to work mm. hard, and to correle away. Which means run, run, because, you know, the day just has not a lot of hours and you have to finish your stuff yeah. and, you know, so you Jared have to run I, in the kitchen. <laughs> Jared and I worked <laughs> in a Greek restaurant for a while and the similarity was tucka, tucka, tucka. Way to go. Always go, 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 right? Uh, so great stuff. Great way to get this thing started. So where does it make sense to start telling your story? Take it to the point where you fell in love with the industry and you knew this was going to be your path. Oy, um, well, um, after prep school, um, you know, like a crazy kid, 17 years old. I told my parents I wanted to be a chef. They kind of uh, fell down the, the sofa, but um, <laughs> I, I had a passion for cooking since then. Um, I grew up with uh, my grandfather and my father cooking, um, always watched them cook. Um, I thought that that would be the, the, the you know, um, one of the careers that I was passionate for. Um, I had uh, a really great aunt that she was very well connected in Mexico and she put me to practicing in a few different kitchens around Mexico City. So in my research, it looked like it, it started in Mexico City. Was, that, was there anything that's worth mentioning before making it to Mexico City or is that where you got your start? That's where I, I got my start. Um, you know, practicing and uh, going from kitchen to kitchen, learning and see. Uh, basically, you know, the chefs looking at me if I had it or not. Actually, one of the chefs told me, I don't think you're going to make it, so oh, just go to school. When did this happen along somewhere. the timeline? Yeah. Was this somewhere in the, the middle of your career? At the beginning. Or? Oh, Literally, really? it was at the beginning. Well, I was 17 years old, a kid. I never stepped, uh, you know, foot in a, uh, on a real kitchen. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was a bummer, but I was like... I'm going to pretend I'm not going to listen to you and I'm just going to keep going. Yeah, I think I think I, I wanted to pull back a layer on that just because I feel like a lot of times uh, we hear all the time that people who become successful in this industry usually have one person that recognized something in them and said, hey, like you got what it takes. You're good at this. And that that positive reinforcement is what kept them on the track and they, they felt pride in what they were doing. But it sounds like early on you had the opposite situation where somebody said maybe you shouldn't <laughs> be doing this. So my question for you is how did you – you said you kind of just shrugged it off, but like get deeper into that. How did you kind of not let that like completely um, derail you? I mean, it was a shock because uh, at that time, um, cooking it was not like you know was uh, so uh, famous, you know, or so typical just to do it back in Mexico. So and he was one of the best chefs in Mexico Ooh. who told me that. Ah, so because I remember hurt. very well that I was just standing there and then. He asked me to go grab me that, uh, you know, saute pan out of the oven. I went and got it for him and gave it to him. And then after that, he called me in the office like, I don't I don't see you in the kitchen. So I think. Uh, Did you I stay at this restaurant? <laughs> no. <laughs> Was that the last uh, day? No. Well, after that, uh, I think I stayed for a week long. OK. Um, and I moved up to another another restaurant. Do you remember the, the dialogue in your head that you had to like how you kind of talked yourself out of that, that situation to have the. I'm not, you know what? It, it, it happened so long yeah, ago I, I that now you. I just kind of laugh about it. I hear you. Um, but, um, but no, I mean, it, it didn't strike. I mean, I, I, I knew that, uh, that I, I wanted to pursue this. And I'm very stubborn sometimes. 
Uh, don't ask my partner here. <laughs> uh, but um, but I knew that I, I was I needed to try it. Yeah. I needed to try somewhere else. So so you came to New York City in 1996. Yeah. Uh, what time did you get started working in uh, Mexico City? Um, like around 93 at the the end of 93. So I was like three years, three years. before. And yeah. How many restaurants did you work in in that three years? Um, year? I work in three. Okay. Is there um, one restaurant in particular that you feel like you most transformed? Yeah, um, when I work at the Nico Hotel back in the day, uh, French cuisine was just like the you know the the mecca of uh, of the of cuisine and cooking. So after going to La Hacienda Los Morales, where this chef told me that I, I didn't have it, I went and practiced there. So practice it was nine to two, just you know the typical shift Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. and I was there every day. Um, so when Les Celebrités, obviously a French chef is there, beautiful kitchen. It was like some sort of a stadium. It was just an amazing kitchen, one of the best I ever worked. Um, very professional, everyone, very, very professional. And also, you know, like any other career, you know, you get jealousy and stuff. So everybody was bothering me because I was just like, you know, the, the spoiled kid that I wanted to just go and learn how to, I don't, I don't know, just to one cut some onions so um one day um one of uh one of the cooks actually that i was working with every day didn't show up to work okay opportunity so <laughs> the french um chef uh chef alban du temple um came and is like hey um you want the job i was like yeah all right you start now so, so what was that like getting that opportunity what was it like <laughs> getting that that promotion I mean, to, you know, practicing is not even getting paid, obviously. From that moment to, like, getting paid and having that responsibility, it was huge for me. I was super excited. Um, and where in this three-year period are we at this point? At the beginning. Beginning, um, okay. Before, obviously, I came, it was, like, uh, maybe six months after I started, like, even holding the knife. So take us through that evolution. Like, try to, like is there... Or maybe is there the next restaurant you went to where you maybe took on uh, a more serious role? Were you ever a chef de cuisine or an executive chef at these restaurants? Well, um, that I mean, I was six months that just started. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. for you to get promoted until like almost a, uh, you call it, uh, um, in Mexico, you, it, you have different uh, grades of, of to be a cook. So first you're like uh, basically a helper. Then you come uh, cook B and then a cook A. So for you to get from like helper to cook A usually takes you um, three to four years in that kitchen. It took me um, it took me a year to go there. So, so what did you do that was different than other people? Obviously, there is probably a <coughs> natural ability, a natural inclination. But did you do anything different than other folks to kind of make that happen in an expedited way? Yeah, um, I mean, I was there early. Um, earlier than usual, you know, I was just uh, there later if they need me. If I need to double, I double. I was just, uh, you know, I try to do my best True, every like single you day. It. It's yeah. something that comes up a lot on yeah. the show, and it sounds like <laughs> you were probably doing that. So I, I know, like we said, it was 1996 where I believe it was Chef Richard uh, Sandoval. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Came to Mexico City on a trip, uh, and he discovered you somehow, some way. Yeah. Where were you at this point? This is three years later or two and a half years later from when you get your first line cook right. role and you kind of climb the ladder? Well, actually, um, it happened uh, a little different. Um, I was working at Les Celebrities at this French restaurant, um, so a new cook came in and I was training him. Um, and I said, you know what, I think I'm ready just to leave Mexico and go somewhere else. You have any contacts? And he's like, yeah, I have one in New York and one in Spain. Where are you gonna go first or try first? Well, I said New York. So he, Why New York? I don't, I, I don't know. It was just the first. I mean, I've been here all over the states by then. Um, I mean, I was lucky to, that my parents brought me everywhere, but uh, I n I was never been here in New York. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, what it's better than New York to to start your career as a cook? Right. So that's what I said. Let's go to New York. I wanted to have something different. Okay. And how did you discover uh, this opportunity with Chef Richard? So this this guy um, give me a number of like I know the manager of uh, one of the restaurants. When you call, I call, pick up the phone, literally call this guy. He's like, well, um, I cannot help you, but I can just pass you with the owner that he's here. Okay. 
and it was Richard Sandoval and he picked up the phone and talked to me and I said oh um, you know I'm looking for an opportunity I'm from Mexico I work here I do this blah 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 and he's like um, okay well yeah thank you but I don't need uh, anyone uh, anyone at this time I was like okay so I told him where I work I told him where I was and the next um, the next day uh, the sous chef I don't know he calls me Julian the uh, sous Julian the the, the the sous chef the in sous New chef. York or in, no no York? no okay. the sous chef in in the restaurant in Mexico gotcha, gotcha. Julian you have a phone call and I go pick up the phone and it's Richard Sandoval hey I thought about it I think I want you to you come must have here. done some research <laughs> <laughs> well I don't even know because it was nothing to search I don't think yeah. it didn't Google exists back then um, and then the, I was like oh okay he's like when when can you come two weeks I was like uh, all right let me let me see. So from that moment on, my my life changed. Yeah. Um, I was here two weeks after. So I didn't know where I was going to stay. <laughs> so you're <laughs> in New York. Take us to that. What, what that was like? Uh, the experiences you were experiencing. It was just uh, funny. I mean, I. Um, he's like, uh, talk to the manager, and he will arrange everything for you. Where you're gonna stay? You just look for him. So I talked to him, and he's like, oh, okay, this Mexican dude too that I end up he end up being my roommate nice. or vice versa makes it a little easier yeah so he's like okay from JFK you take the bus to the city they're gonna leave you in Grand Central from Grand Central Station you take a cab to the restaurant and uh, it was uh, it was the restaurant was called Saban it was not Mexican at all it was American nation at that time it was just like the whole like the you know the uh, reductions and okay. uh, balsamic and all, all over the place and the squeeze bottles and so it was very eclectic it was totally new for me okay. uh, i mean i came from like a really french trained um restaurant so when you came onto this new restaurant in new york city what role did you take on originally um <laughs> um i started like prepping like whatever they didn't even need me mm -hmm. um so he just pushed me into that restaurant the chef was american uh the sous chef was american and there were a few Mexicans, and he's like, listen, I don't need you here. I don't know why he brought you in. I really, you know, one day you're gonna prep, one day you're just gonna help the salad guy. One day I was like. It kind of like, sounds like from like this, from maybe the restaurant tourist perspective, Richard's perspective, he saw an opportunity, maybe he wanted to put you in the bullpen for something that he wanted yeah. to do later on. He's like, I have an opportunity for a, a, a different vertical, different type of cuisine. This person's approaching me. Like, why say no to this opportunity? Maybe yeah. we can create something for him. Is that, do you think that played into it? I don't think so. I don't, he, he, did, he was not even here when I I'm came I'm speculating in. right now. <laughs> he was not even here when okay. I came in. He was not even uh, in the kitchen. I mean, it's like he was just all over the place. Uh, so then, and then I end up like you know showing this chef Jeff uh, that he become a good friend of mine, like what I was capable to do and take on a station on my own and uh, just help him. And then until we start drinking Guinness at the end of the shift, <laughs> so that was that was that worked out perfectly. So when did things start to transition into more of a serious role where they saw that what you could do, they saw that you had talent? When did you start really taking the bull by the horns? Yeah, um, well, then, you know, I find out that Richard wanted to open a Mexican restaurant because 1996, 1997, before 2000, there were not a lot, a lot of Mexican restaurants back then. So he saw the opportunity to open something different and fresh and new and uh, exciting. Um, and this is Maya. That, that was Maya. And then he started looking for a chef. So I was like, I thought he was a chef, but I didn't know exactly what was going on. So a few Mexican chefs came and did some tastings and stuff and here and there. And his partner in those Saban restaurants, he was American. And he's like, no, I don't want to get involved. You know, I mean, everything was for like going to failure there. Um, and then he decided, oh, I'll be the chef. So everything um, at Maya w w uh, was going, sorry. Yeah, Maya was going to down the, the, the tubes. Basically, I mean, saying, even before we got there, it's just like he didn't have a lot of money to open. He took like a huge space on First Avenue that Knowing is still there. Knowing what you know now, like how would you di dissect that situation? Uh, what would have taken that? Well, I mean, obviously you got into the 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 the, the, the pilot seat or the, the chef yeah. seat. And, and you eventually got two stars, right, from New York? Yeah. So I mean, I was ready. I mean, I was just like, you know what? If he pays me, I'm good. <laughs> you know, I mean, I... Uh, I was very excited. Um, 
and then we we decided we were opening the, he started with a menu he was there for a week basically and then he just like step out of the kitchen and he's like you're in charge so early on you said it was going down the tubes well i'll i'll, 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 I'll tell you i'll tell you i'll tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you the story Please. i'm telling you i mean everything seemed like it was just chaotic because he didn't want to be the chef and then he oh, ended okay. up being the gotcha, chef gotcha. so we started like you know developing this menu by now my my training is french I mean, obviously, I'm from Mexico, but I, I, I did, I didn't know shit about Mexican cuisine. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm allowed to. You curse? can, you can say oh, whatever sorry. comes out of your mouth. There's no <laughs> filtering here. I was like, seriously, I didn't know how to cook a simple thing of Mexican food. I was like, I, I mean, I, I need to study, I need to research. So, um, I asked my parents uh, when they were coming to New York, bring me books. So I started you know researching and doing and stuff i mean back in the day it was like now you can find chipotle jalapenos anything in any in any supermarket back in the day it was like nothing around this area only east harlem yeah. that was where the mexicans yep. are we used to, i remember we used to come and buy mole and with la coche from like a, a store here in Trying 103rd and yeah. lexington because there was none yeah so and obviously i didn't even know how to make mole so I, i'm calling the, my sous chef back in mexico my friends it's like hey how do you make <laughs> this how do you make that i love the honesty it's like i have like a hundred recipes they're all french so i think that was very important in my in my career because i'm assuming um, this is all before the two stars yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what what like when did things really start to pick up when did you Oy. catch when did you start to catch stride and, and figure it out and so take us through that? i mean richard left me there after a week so i'm i'm in charge okay and and the restaurant was very slow very very slow he hired a pr company so one day the pr company called richard and said oh um Gail Green was at Maya, Richard, and she didn't like it. I remember that day Richard got wasted at the bar. He was sitting at a stool, and then he just fell backwards. Like, <laughs> the, the porter has, had to pick it up, you know. Um, we were, like, devastated because we worked so hard for it. And then two weeks later, uh, we got a call. And it's like, oh, the New York Times is reviewing you for this Wednesday. We're like really fucked <laughs> we are completely screwed um then for making a hundred covers once they come we got two stars we have a line out the door we're making four or five hundred covers from that so that was that was real and that was that was that was uh the part that it was it started getting real yeah i like to d try to dissect stories a little bit and i think that one thing that is just coming to my mind listening to your story is just the power of doing something different uh, at the time, before 2000, we're talking 1996, there weren't many Mexican restaurants in New York City, right? So it's probably because you were a unique concept, that, you, that, that was your unique selling proposition, right? Yeah. You had something that nobody else was doing. Would you, do, do you think you would have gotten the attention from the New York Times if you weren't so you know, in left field and you weren't so out of the box? Do you think that maybe played into the, even gave um, the opportunity to get the review? I mean, yeah, we were new, we were fresh, we were different. We were making stuff that nobody's seen in the Mexican cuisine here in New York. Um, I think that was the key. And yeah. uh, from now on, we, we are the one, one of the, f the first restaurant that Mexican that earned two stars. Yeah. Um, we're packed, everyone is excited. I mean, it was just a, a, a dramatic change in the, in the Mexican scene. In the, I mean, here in New York, because now everyone is looking at us, not yeah. only from the Mexican restaurant that existed, but from all the restaurants everywhere. That's amazing. So what was that like, that transition of kind of like crickets being kind of slow, not having <laughs> a lot of business to all of a sudden 90 miles an hour, uh, New York Times, two stars, everybody wants to check you out. You're on everyone's spot. Yeah, that was, uh, I mean, back in the day, back in the 2000s, that was, that was the, the impact of the New York Times. Now it's all different, but, uh, but whoever got reviewed, they had a line out the door from the Times. I mean, it was just Ruth Rachel wrote an amazing review. Um, obviously, uh, ev everything was Richard because he was. But you had experience in busy restaurants in New York City, so it's not like well, <laughs> you weren't used to that capacity, that, no. that volume, or was it no, different? No, I mean, uh, at Savan, it was a 55-seat place. Okay. We, at the most, we used to do 100 covers. So this was completely new to you. Oh, yeah. 
Totally. What was that like? How was that transition well, into I, such a busy I, restaurant? I totally learned a lot as as I was going. I mean, I was what I was 23 years old. Wow. So, and I was the chef that was in there. Um, when things mellowed down a little bit, I was like, okay, I need to I need to do something. And it's like I'm always have a you know, you know, uh, a chip in my shoulder. That I need to do something else. So I was like, I need to go to school because I think that's important and stuff. So. Um, once it was settled, you know, from, you know, being busy every day, I, I used to work seven days, like, I don't know, 14, 12 hours, depends, depends, 12 hours, 13 hours, go to the fish market sometimes at three o'clock in the morning. It was just uh, chaotic. How, how but did you but have I was time 23. to do school? How did you I mean, time the, the school school in the middle yeah, of the Yeah, so, um, so I went and started looking, researching for some schools. Back in the day, it was French School in our Institute. It was here in the city. Um, it was nine to three, Monday to Friday. So I said, Richard, I'm going to school nine to three. I will be here at four. I will have everything ready and, and cook service and expedite at the same time for 500 people. So and how long were you um, in school? I was there for, it was like eight months. Eight six, months? Six to eight months, yeah. Did you uh, approach burnout at any time during that eight <laughs> months, uh, taking classes from nine to three and then working till probably what, was midnight, one o'clock? Yeah, in the morning? I mean, I didn't have a full day off in those six months, basically, because How was my day health? off, it was Monday and or something. Sometimes I would take a Sunday, but but I never, I never. Did you ever hit a wall at any of these points? And no, I was so excited. That's and then awesome. the, the thing. <laughs> It's funny because the thing that when you go to school and then it's like all these, you know, young um, guys that and, and girls that they wanted to become chefs. But also they were like the lawyer or the doctor that they didn't like their career and they wanted to be chefs too. So older people, so it was, it was just going to the class. So, so you graduate the French Culinary Institute in 1999, right? Yes. Um, then you, that's your first executive chef role with Shishimi Samba. Am I saying that? Sushi right? Samba. Sushi, sorry, Sushi Samba. Uh, what was that like? That that transition into uh, the executive chef role. This is your first executive um, chef position. Well, actually, um, a Richard's brother who was a general manager, he moved to Sushi Samba and he started there. And he's like, "Hey, you want to come and talk to the owner?" And then I think we're looking for people. We're expanding. So I went there. Um, it was when they were opening the second location, so I was going to be the chef of one. Um, and I didn't think it twice. I was like, I, I think it's fine, uh, time for me to move, to learn something different. And um, I moved and, and started working there. So before we start diving into the, the next series of your, your you know, career, I mean, from, two, from 2000 basically to, I think, 2014, I counted something like eight or ten restaurants you opened so it's gonna be hard to focus yeah uh, but up to this point reflecting back on your career up to graduating culinary school were there any key mentors any people who, who you think really influenced who you were up to that point values ethics business knowledge anything like that that you can share from us any nuggets you can extract well um, I think uh, Richard was uh, also a big role in my career because he gave me the opportunity what did you learn from Richard give me something specific that he taught you um, I learned how to drink tequila with him. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't learn how to drink tequila <laughs> in Mexico? Uh, sometimes, <laughs> but just the shitty ones. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he was just a businessman all the time. So I think um, I said I want. I you know I learned a lot of from him about what? business. Because uh, after after you know after being here in New York and then he started expanding. He wanted to open in San Francisco and here and there. So he always had like a vision and he always like went for things. I think that's why also I am now that I want to go and grab everything and uh, try to, to, you know, to focus in just like opening places and different concepts and stuff. And he th always think out of the box. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's what I learned from him. So the, the, to summarize, uh, he always had a vision and he always took a risk and went after it and he was always thinking outside of the box. Yeah. Give me an example of how he would think outside of the box. Um, I don't know. It was, it, it's, it's hard to explain. Um, he will just like come up with like, he will just like literally like I do sometimes, I jump into the kitchen and he start making a dish from like, oh, we don't have special, okay. And then he will just like come up with things or go to the walk-in and just start grabbing just make things. Just happen, and right? And, um, you know, things like that, you know, he very charismatic. I learned that from him, too. He's like talk to everyone, try to talk to everyone. 
Um, so I don't know. He was just like always um, in his own world, but you're always thinking, you know, uh, for the business. All right, so we're back, and I don't know how – there's no way we're going to touch every one of these openings, <laughs> every one of these experiences. So yeah. why don't you get, like, zoom up to 30,000 feet for me. Get an aerial view looking back at your life. Which one of these experiences do you think was most transformative for you? Uh, maybe somebody who you like, encountered at one of these openings that really had an impact on who you are today. Can you take us to that point, the first time this really happened for you? Um now that uh, you ask, uh, ask that question, it's just like it's, it's I think everyone, ev it, uh, you know, when you, when you open so many places and stuff, you have someone that taught you life um, and th they teach you something. Like, for example, the owner of uh, Sushi Samba, Shimon, he was just very businessman and very, very tough. Like, I learned from him that, that I don't want to be like him. You know, he was just like an asshole sometimes. And I hope, uh, Shimon, I love you, if you're hearing that, <laughs> if you're listening to this one, I love you, thank you. I, I learned a lot. He was just very businessman, and he, yeah. um, I mean, he was just like, he, want, he was very anal, and he wanted everything perfect. So I learned from that that just like, you know, um, I needed to be there when I needed to be there, and I needed to focus and, you know, do good food, and that was, that was the whole point. But uh, you bring up a really important point, and that is that you learn from both positive and negative experiences yeah um you, you learn what not to do yeah right? uh so thank you for bringing that to the table what about keep going anybody else that comes to mind really? um well after sushi samaki actually gave me the opportunity to open the one in miami so i went and opened that in miami in 2002 i was there for a year you know i think it might help if we just real quick without getting into detail just run through like, okay. that, like, like that 15 year period <laughs> right. to, to give the listeners an idea of what you did and you and have then we'll dissect it a i little have bit. 20 seconds go <laughs> yeah go for it so uh, um, we, i think we left off at sushi uh, yeah so Samabi. sushi samba 2002 i opened for a year in miami then i came the richard called me again richard sandoval called me again hey i'm opening pampano in the city with placido domingo this, and this is 2003 um you want to come and help me it's like no thank you i'm good here in miami it's just beautiful <laughs> here i can go to the beach before work and then he called me again i was like okay i'll go so i came back to new york um open pampano with him earn another two stars with him that was a lot more my, my input on the menu i cook for william grimes so let's have the breaks real quick and we're <laughs> gonna try to make this quick but what, what did he say to you uh that made you come the second time he called the that first time you weren't going anywhere the second time you're like all right i'll come what, what was mean, different about the second richard call? is always very you know convincing yeah <laughs> like why don't you just come and you know i'll i'm gonna send you a ticket and just come and l let's talk so he showed me the space he showed me you know i'm opening with placido da 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 so that lasted about a year that you were there. Um, yeah. Also, you know, being in Miami for a year it was just, it was great, but uh, I didn't see myself there also. <laughs> so, I mean, New York is, it's, it's what's up. Yeah. And I, that's why I wanted to come back. So that's why I came back. So Zocalo, 2004. Yeah. Then after that, I was like, uh, Richard, start opening in Vegas here. No, you my uh, corporate chef i was like okay well where's the money <laughs> <laughs> the, the only thing that richard was it was it and he's still probably very cheap <laughs> but um which is probably one of those variables that plays yeah. in very significantly when being so a yeah i mean if you want me really to start traveling all over the place you have to pay me so yeah. he didn't want to pay me i moved to sokolo i mean i've been that serious and um i moved to sokolo um also, um, when I got there, it was just like seriously uh, um, a shithole. And I was just like, why am I doing here? Um, Did I you don't turn know. it around? You, <laughs> you were there for three years. Did you turn it around? I turned around, I mean... Uh, over double the business like in three months how did you turn it around take us okay maybe we can hover here for a little bit what did you yeah. do to take it from a shithole to something that turned around that was doing well how did you um, do that? well i started bringing my own people changed completely almost the whole menu uh go to pr um get some press get some boss that you know that place has been open for 10 years already and you know it's just it was it needed a change so people started loving it people started coming back 
and that's how I turn it around in such a short period of time. Um, it, good food, good uh, environment. I mean, yeah. So, 2008, or sorry, 2007, uh, Toloche. Did I say that correctly? Yes, <laughs> Toloche. Yeah. Toloche. Uh, 2007, why, why make the move? What was going on? Um, so, one of my partners starts... Um, I don't know. I, I met him through uh, some waiter from Sokolo. Oh, you should meet this guy, la, la, la. So he came over. Hey, I wanted to show you space. Uh, I wanted to open a Mexican place. So he showed me what uh, Toloache on 50th is. It was a shitty Italian restaurant that they had. Um, he came in with, um, with um, a manager of Rosa Mexicano which I was just like, uh, I'm not sure. He's like, oh, the three of us, like, no, thank you. I'm just, I don't know. If what? I want to do something, you want to approach me, just approach me, don't approach someone else. Okay. And it, I, did, I mean, I, by now I opened so many restaurants. It was, if I wanted to open a restaurant as, uh, with, with the partner, uh, I just, I mean, you know, I didn't want to have like 10 partners and stuff, so. Um, I knew exactly what I wanted, and then I said, thank you, but no. He asked me again, like a few months later, he asked me again without the guy, <laughs> without the other manager. I was like, okay, all right, this seems like we can do something. So, so I think it's really important um, that you understand what, what you want, right? That's what I'm picking up from you, understanding what you want and then not budging when you know what you want. And if it's not what you want, then don't take, then don't just go because it's an opportunity. I think people take right. blind opportunities all the time in this industry because they're hungry for their own restaurant. Yeah. It's the dream is what they want. It's what they've always wanted, their own restaurant. Yeah. And then they get this opportunity and they dangle the carrot in front of them and they bite and they don't take the, the time to do the due diligence to make sure these partners are the right fit for me, same values, same vision, the line for all this stuff. Was that what was going through your head or are there it, things I'm missing? You know, it, it's hard to, to pick I mean, to pick a, a business partner. Um, I'm lucky that I pick um, my partner here, Megan, uh, for La Chula's, but, uh, but it's very hard to pick a partner. You can come into the frame real quick, <laughs> Megan, if you want to wave for the camera. She's, she's been kind of <laughs> lurking in the shadows real quick. <laughs> so, but uh, but it's, it's hard. You, I mean, I thought we were a good match, and I have two other, uh, like two partners in Toluache, Tacuba, Copelia. So just um, to, so yeah. to bring it to... Paint the big picture again. 2017, Toliacha, uh, three partners, now two partners. Well, two and, and myself. And then you, the second time, myself. they drop one partner. So now yeah. you only have two partners. Um, and you go for it. Um, that's where you were kind of picking up, I think. Yeah. Um, so he showed me the space. And I was just like, uh, um, I don't know. You have, uh, every time that I see a space and I walk it through, I mean, I know from right there if it could just like, be something or not i don't know just uh yeah. i'm kind of anal on that or i'm lucky yeah that i can just like visual things and i just like um it was like a italian restaurant they had a, a brick oven i was like oh perfect we can just do this and that and that and then i have so many ideas and stuff i transform the kitchen i change it i clean it i open it i make it brighter uh, make it uh, we hire like a little designer so she helped us you know design a little bit the restaurant um so we kept a lot of things there um, um, it took really like six to eight months to open the place and it was up and running um, yeah so uh, we started at uh, Midtown West I mean I didn't have a clue it was Midtown <laughs> I always work Upper East uh, you know Midtown East uh, West Side but never in the theater district so what was the difference um, for those of us not you know, from New York City. Um, I thought, oh, we have to, I have to come up with a menu that is just not too crazy, but, you know, approachable for all the tourists that come uh, to pre-theater and stuff. So because everyone is just driving me crazy about pre-theater, this, that, and tourists. So um, I, I just changed that menu like a hundred times. It's like literally like a hundred times, make it bigger, make it smaller. Were you just uh, trying to find the sweet spot? Was that a struggle for you? No, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but I just wanted to give something that it was just a special and also give something that for a tourist that it comes from middle America or whatever, that um, they're not familiar or they're not very familiar with Mexican cuisine, but like a good chicken quesadilla, why not? Okay. So that was the, that was the whole thing, just like a variation of 
Mexican cuisine approachable and the ones that I wanted to the New Yorkers um, experience. So what was your biggest lesson in your time, your two years or your one year at, uh, I'm not going to say this right, I, I just... Tolo <laughs> Toloache. <laughs> Toloache, thank you. <laughs> um, there is just like the work hard. I mean, it's just like it changes. It <laughs> it's different. It's, uh, it's totally different. Um, you know, midtown is just learn from something else. Learn. Um, you learn something every day. You know, I learn something like when I open a restaurant, I shouldn't do this or what I should do that. What was the biggest lesson you learned at this time? Oy. It's hard to say. Um, the biggest lesson. I don't. I don't know. Um, think of one, the first one that comes to mind. Biggest lesson. I think, um, I think uh, the biggest lesson, I think, it was just uh, to, to, to stay humble in whatever I was doing, teach people, um, have like a kind of close relationship with your employees, like meaning um, teach them on an everyday basis how to do things. I mean, I, I was just very focused stay focused that's what it is so 2008 what happens in 2008 to leave this restaurant and go open yerba uh, buena yerba buena did that do you look good in that one yerba yeah. Buena. Okay. <laughs> yeah we um my partner wanted to open like a latin place and you know right. fun and sexy and stuff so he asked me to come and just um you know make the menu and stuff so we start you know making the menu latin fresh or small different from all over the place so at this point you're you're a, a partner you you have equity in these restaurants you're opening correct? yeah um it sounds like in, in uh 2000 from like 2008 to 2014 it was like a crazy series of years yeah uh, you had you opened one an another uh yerba buena yes uh sorry I'm well I'm but at right. but this point at the you know the first all watch i put i put some money um i think if you put a skin on the game a little bit it just makes you more aware of things instead of just like using someone else's money yeah. so i put i put uh, not a lot but a small amount of money and then since then uh, you know i c we keep going with the same things these so. must have been successful concepts because in 2007 you opened the first tele to uh, totally uh, i can't say these words my mouth just came <laughs> not form these words and then you opened the second one in uh, 2011 uh almost four years yeah. four years later uh so you had successful you, you know two uh yerba buena yeah uh, so you're doing good concepts. There's definitely traction that these restaurants are um, taking on. Um, then you open a third one in, again in 2000. So you open total. So three. Uh, say the word for me again. Tolia. Toloache. <laughs> Toloache. Thank you. <laughs> um, what was it about these concepts that were so powerful, so strong, where you you can open so many of them in a short period? Of time? I think we were on a roll. Um, at that point, uh, I think uh, we knew exactly what we were doing and how um, you know coming with these concepts it was just uh, something new a little bit of new and different um, people start knowing me more and more the press and stuff so they start liking me a little bit more now they don't but that's another story so these restaurants <laughs> are still going strong to this day right yeah 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 um, um, yeah uh, the Yerba Buena side, we, we don't have them anymore because um, you know we, we lost both of the leases actually um, and then the, the, you know, the landlords, they wanted uh, crazy rent. Okay. But, um, yeah. So you said, you mentioned something quickly that there was another story um, where people didn't like you? What, nah, nah. <laughs> what happened there? No, nah, I think everybody likes me. <laughs> everybody loves me. <laughs> no, that's not true. So um, where are we today? Kind of paint the picture for where we are today. Um, and I guess, is there anything different with this opportunity where we're seeing now with La Chula that that you decided to break off on your own um, and to focus on this project? I think, uh, as I said, you know, there's periods of time in my life that I think uh, um, I started thinking out of the box too and I wanted to do something also different. And also, you know, it's, uh, it's also good to change a little bit with partners and with uh, people that you do things. It's good to change the partners. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still very, uh, I have great relationship with my other partners. Um, but uh, but I think it was just time to, to for me to start doing something. Uh, at this point, I I, be, I get offers like a lot. I, bet. Um, I don't take all of them, obviously. Um, but uh, it was it was about time. So S yeah. so I personally come from the belief that I think in today's age, especially in a market like New York City, um, I don't think you can do it without partners. 
anymore. I mean, to be competitive today, to be able to, to run all the facets that a, a successful restaurant needs, you can't be in all those places at once. And people, the, the truly passionate people that get into this industry don't get into it for the money. They get into it for where yeah. the, the, the passion, for the, the, the work of it, to, to have you know, the, the identity of it all, to, to, to tie their identity to it. So, I mean, to, to, to do the job right, I think you need partners. And yeah. you said that you're very selective or very picky about the partners you select. So what is going through your mind when people are approaching you for opportunities? Like, how do you choose the partners that... that well, I don't have a right. lot, you know, but uh, working partners are always great. Uh, that's what I have here in La Chula. Um, Megan is amazing. Uh, she's been helping me a lot. Um, she's, she, came, she came from totally different uh, scene. She used to work in, you know, fashion and magazines and stuff. So... Um, uh, I like uh, I like her because she also thinks out of the box like I do, and she comes with great ideas all the time, and I think we complement very well together. So um, although sometimes she wants to kill me, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, but you know I, I think it works. So um, what is it about? What are the elements of your partnership that work well? Maybe we can get. Uh, Megan on the mic too to kind of chime in and to talk about how you two complement each other. Obviously, maybe it's not completely obvious. I'm sure you you add other uh, variables to the team, other variables to the mix aside from the, your experience in the kitchen. Uh, but I'm sure that's your kind of your lane, the back of house. Yeah. What's Megan's lane? How does Megan? Um, Megan I think team? when um, I think to choose a partner, you you're not perfect on everything, so you have weak uh, weak uh, weak points weaknesses and you have strong points so i think um to bring what is the best on me the strong part and then the missing part is what megan does so um i try to be around successful people and smart people to help me through my business and she's one of them beautiful um i i noticed it looks like we're, we're staring at a fast casual concept right now the tulip uh is this your first fast casual yes so why, why make this pivot? It looks like you're kind of doing, obviously, full service, Mexican food. What, what was the, the purpose for the pivot to pass? Um, I think uh, uh, the business has changed a lot through, like, the years. Um, obviously, you know, it's, 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 it's hard now to operate restaurants uh, financially talking because um, you spend a lot more money just, like, you know, in employees and payroll and food and everything just being up and up and up taxes uh, minimum wage you name it so i thought that the, this idea uh, the, the first one that i opened in grand central um it's fast casual it's not even sit down so you go you pick up your food and you go um so there is no servers there is not a lot of like so manager overhead down. drama yes to try to, co to cut the cover the overhead down and also having a menu which is reduced uh, affordable because it is very affordable and just bring people in that's uh, that's what it is and that's what is just the challenge now you know bring more people in um, because there's small checks so more people has to come so when you were trying to when you're opening this restaurant how were you trying to differentiate at that time how were you trying to stand out what was your your uh, angle for that what was your plan for standing out and, and creating something unique in New York City um, I think um, uh, Mexico City style taquerias, there are none. I mean, there is a few tacos like uh, Numero Uno, or um, and then there is like you know this fast casual, mm, what I would call not authentic Mexican. I don't know. I'm not gonna name any anybody, but um, but no, I think <laughs> <laughs> like Chipotle and all okay. that stuff. It's just <laughs> like that, and then from there, just everyone wanted to do the next Chipotle. So, so, so your unique selling proposition was authenticity. Yeah. Uh, and uh, anything else? No, just be authentic, have a good product, fresh ingredients, um, and then just do it as authentic as yeah. as we could. So, uh, we're approaching the point now. We're almost at 50 minutes of recording time. Crazy how time goes by so fast, right? Yeah. Um, anything we did not discuss up to this point that's near and dear to your heart that you want to bring to the table? I have a few things I want to bring to the table before we go to the speed round, but what's near and dear to your heart that we have not discussed up to this point? 
Uh, besides tequila, I, I just <laughs> don't know. Um, no, my daughter. Um, at one point when I opened my first restaurant, Toloache, my daughter was born. She's 11 now, and she's going to be 12 in November. So um, Toloache is my first Toloache anniversary. Um, my first. My 12th anniversary is coming up. So she's going to turn 12 in November. She's uh, the love of my life. I just... I, I guess I keep working for her. Um, so that is one of my, uh, that's why I wake up every, every morning. So since you bring it up, how do you balance that, that love for your, your daughter and the business side of things? How do you make time for your daughter? How, how do you, how I, do you, that? you know, I always, I always make time for her. Um, how do you make sure you make time for her? Is there something that you do that we can learn? Uh, do you block out time? Do you schedule time? Like, how do you do it? You know, I'm lucky because I can, my schedule depends on me and what I do. Um, now she's in a school and she has something in the middle of the day, I'll make sure that I'll go to that. Um, when I have the free time, hey, I'm, I'm coming and pick you up from school. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm lucky that I can just like do that. And yeah. I'm always there for her. I call her probably five, six times a day to see how she's doing. Yeah. I call it um, because I'm, I'm divorced, so I call her every morning before she goes to school, 7 a.m. every single morning. Um, I stay very close. I have a good relationship with her. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just like, I, I'm actually taking her out for lunch Beautiful. today. So I love it. Yeah. Well, hopefully we get wrapped up soon enough that you can uh, make sure you make that appointment. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. But one thing I really want to talk about, and uh, it's going to get a little personal, but I think it's something that's really important that we talk about. Um, you, you, you live in the, the American dream, right? You're from Mexico. You're an immigrant to the United States, living the American dream with extreme success. And there's a lot of stereotypes, I feel yeah. like, with, with different immigrants to the, the, to the United States. But you're breaking all those rules. I mean, you're, you're having extreme uh, success despite all the stereotypes and the racism and everything. Yeah. What, what is your advice for somebody who might be an immigrant um, uh, coming up who has the dream but maybe thinking they can't do it, but when you've clearly done it, like what's your yeah. advice for that person? Um, well, first of all, I came legally to this country, just to make it clear. <laughs> I didn't say illegal immigrant, I said immigrant. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, uh, now I feel more like a New Yorker American than anything. Uh, I actually live here longer than I live in Mexico. Um, Mexico is dear to my heart, but I think uh, this is my home. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when t when the kids come and stuff, or, or people that they really wanted to come and, and, and do that, it's just like, you know what, work from the bottom. Um, and then, you know, if you have it, you just like, you know, you're gonna go up. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work hard for what I have. Nobody gave me anything, so um, work, work, work. I mean, that's the only thing, and then, you know, that's what I tell, uh, you know, young Mexican chefs when they come. Have you had, had to overcome stereotypes and racism during your time? Yeah, of course. Yeah, totally. How's, um, what's your advice for people who are dealing with that themselves, who are trying to make their life? Um, I just, you know what, when that happens, I don't pay too much attention. Um, I make jokes out of it instead. Um, I find that um, I, I try to change it to something positive. Um, and that's how this world, we live in this world and, and I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. So you really have to live your life day by day and live it happily and, you know, work and smile and, and just like they're always going to be haters and, you know, good luck to them. And, you know, I think the other thing that we have to remind ourselves of all the time is that this country is built from immigration. Yeah. Like immigrants. We're all immigrants. At one point, yeah. our ancestors immigrated to this country. It's what we're built on. And yeah. I think it's crazy how we lose sight of that sometimes, you know. Um, right. I love this conversation. Uh, one thing I ask all my guests, uh, because the mission statement is to inspire, empower, and transform the industry. So let me ask you, how have you transformed since getting your first gig in Mexico City. Who are you today versus that man you were back then, that, that, that young man you were back then? Well, I was a kid when I came <laughs> in. I, mean, um, I think I'm very, you know, um, very lucky. Um, I changed completely, obviously. i grown uh, so much. Um, having responsibilities from like a young age um, and being here by myself, uh, away from my family, away from my friends and stuff. Uh, but I, I built up... Uh, something that also everybody wants to build, you know, um, 
you know, uh, career, um, you know, my daughter, um, friends. So, I mean, it, it changed, it changed completely. I mean, I, I look back and I don't believe that it's just past 25 years. We're back, and the first question I have for you is, what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? Oy, uh, be humble, be a team player. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that I, I always do. I dig it. What is your biggest weakness? Uh, wow. Um, I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> that's a hard question because, I it mean, is. what is your weakness? I mean, My biggest weakness? Um, organization, uh, <laughs> I mean, I could keep on going, but we only have a few more minutes here. <laughs> um, my biggest weakness, um, I'm all over the place always. Yeah. I think I'm just like, I'm starting with something and then I just move on without finishing the first thing, I guess. What is one question you ask or thing you look for during the interview process? Um, I don't know. Um, I always ask, what do you see yourself in five years? What are you looking for? Um, I don't that know. they have a plan? That, that, <laughs> that like they, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, what do you look yourself? I don't know. Probably not working for you. I was like, okay, next. <laughs> What's your <laughs> biggest challenge today? Uh, the staff. The staffing is just like, uh, it's, it's hard to get these days. It's just like nobody wants to work. Definitely the biggest challenge in the industry by far for so many people. How are you overcoming it? Um... <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I'm just finding people, whatever I can. It's just it's it's hard to it's hard to tell. Everyone in the industry is just like they're always looking for people. Mm -hmm. Like we're short, um, only in like two restaurants, like three, four people. So it's hard. Share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team. This is a way to be, a way to act. I think uh, you know, customer is always right. Um, you know, um, I'm so anal. The bathrooms are, have to be clean, otherwise. You know, I don't know what's in the kitchen. Attention to detail. Right. right. What is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? This is something that's common um, within, uh, or common within your restaurant, but not common within the, the rest of the industry. Um, you know, I'm I'm just like weird, and um, I always ask um, the waiters and stuff. Uh, you know, wear always black socks. I don't, I just don't know. I don't know. That's <laughs> that's a weird one. So. I so mean, always you have to be very presentable, but if you're wearing like some color, you know, different, it's like, what are you doing? Just well, there's just like little subtleties, like the little things that we don't think about. And again, I think it goes back to that attention and detail. Yeah. And that is a service thing. Uh, yeah. The little things that might just trigger somebody's attention or pull their attention away from yeah. the food that that one person I mean, wearing white socks. You've never seen the socks, but I, I'm, <laughs> what I, I do. It. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, what is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or a restaurant owner? Um... Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. Yes, the, the golden standard. What is your biggest lesson from that book? Um, you know, attention to details and service oriented. I think that he's just like a master on that. Mm. And uh, that book is on Audible. Head over to audibletrial.com slash unstoppable. Get that book for free if you're not already an Audible member. And if you're not mm. listening to audiobooks, you got it. It's a, it's a game changer for people in this industry, I believe. Do you listen to audiobooks? No. Oh, man. That's we got to get you signed I up. I'll <laughs> share the link with you. <laughs> What's one book that you think maybe we'll wait for this uh, fire truck to go by? <laughs> maybe we can still hear us. Yeah. Um, what is one thing you feel restaurateurs don't do well enough or often enough? I think uh, the training staff appreci appreciation, I think, is always very important. And, you know, I like. Last night we were at the Yankee Stadium. I took some of my employees. I always take them, trying to take them out, you know, just to break. Showing that. appreciation. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Uh, what is one piece of technology you've adopted within your restaurants that's had a huge impact on operations, efficiency, communication, profitability, anything along those lines? Well, uh, Megan write this for me because she <laughs> loves a square. The beauty she of She had a, the 800 number on, <laughs> <laughs> on the speed dial on her phone. And that so was Square POS. Square, you know, they, they have payroll, they have uh, customer management, marketing. You, know, you wanna Do you want to hop on the mic, Megan? You're, you're, you're welcome to. <laughs> 
yeah, Square is one of the most recommended platforms on the show for sure. Awesome. Great service, great services there. And uh, this is the last question. It's a doozy. Are you ready for it? Yes. If you got the news, you'd be leaving this world tomorrow. All the memories of you, your work, your restaurants, your memories would be lost with your departure, uh, except for three pieces of wisdom you could leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy. What would those three pieces of wisdom be? It's <laughs> a deep question. Where do you come from these questions, man? Uh, I'm a weird person. <laughs> I don't know. They just come out. I love it. Um, I, I, you know, live, live your day like, like it would be the last one. One. That's be one. Be humble. That's two. Um, love, love, love. And that's three, four, five. <laughs> love it. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much, Jeff. We wrap up every chat by calling somebody out. That's actually how I found you. Lauren uh, Lynch yes. called you out. Uh, she, t- she connected us. Thank you, Lauren. How, who do you respect and admire and believe and make a great guest in the show? Um, I think uh, Daniel Boulou does Ooh. it very, very well. And the bar I, I always go to his restaurants and uh, you know the service the food uh, the detail of attention is just what he sets apart and I, I just like I love him well you've heard it Danielle Balud's clear your schedule I'm coming after you I'd love to get <laughs> you on the show and I'll let the folks at home know how can we connect with you uh, if we want to maybe come join your team learn from you or maybe we have some questions what's the best way to connect um, you can go to our website LaChulaNYC.com and just uh, send us an email. Beautiful. This is episode 631. Head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash 631. I'll have the summary of today's discussion as well as a link to any tools, services, books recommended, and how to connect with Chef Julian. Again, thank you so much, Chef. It, there is no questioning. You are <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was so much fun. Thank you. My pleasure.